and one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Fulton Street Beats. I hope you're all doing good today. And welcome to Drum Talk. A little series we're going to do discussing drums. And at the end, we'll throw in a little bit else for good good measure, some other things. But it's going to be mostly drums today. And uh, on the topic of uh, bearing edges and what's important and what is not. My name is Mr. Mike, if you are not familiar, and um, I hope you'll stick along and along and uh, hear me out today. That's some interesting stuff. Um, I get asked a lot of questions sometimes, being a drum builder, and um, it's kind of surprising um, that a lot of drummers don't realize the importance, they have an idea. They don't realize the importance of a bearing edge and effects of different types of wood. While they might think that they know, generally they are basing their what they think they know on prices and on names. I'll give you for instance. Drum Workshop makes some of the best drums in the business. No dispute about that. But what makes them sound so good? And there's different levels and different tiers, and we say, okay, well, what's the difference with a PDP? What's Pacific Drums? And we know that they're, you know, of course, made in a different country, but what's the difference between the two in sound quality? Well, really not a lot, is there? I mean, they're both outstanding. Um, of course, we pay a lot more for the drum workshop well, because they're made here, and we'll reflect into that in this conversation also. Um, and we may even have to get a little bit political when we start talking about certain things. Bearing edges. Let's just start right out of the gate. Bearing edges. Bearing edges make up 90, again, there's no mistake, 90% of the way a drum sounds. Bearing edges. Okay? And when I say how it sounds, I don't mean the tone. What I mean is the even response of a drum. Of course, our tones will change with whatever resonant wood we're using, whatever acoustic wood or steel or metal or aluminum or bra or whatever we're using. That's going to change. Vibrational frequency is different, but uniform vibrational frequency is 90%, 90% bearing edge. The other 10 is the drum head you're using. Now, of course, there's some common sense things in between, such as, well, do we have proper hoops that aren't bent? Are we tensioning them properly? Are they tuned evenly? Now, this is the stuff that's the common sense aspect. And if you don't know how to do that, you're never going to get a good drum sound anyhow. But what if you already do, like most of us do, we know how to tune our drums, but yet we're still not happy with the tone we're getting. Well, usually that's a bearing edge. And there's some good ways of, well, troubleshooting to see. Now, while Drum Workshop makes some amazing drums, and I'm using them as an example, so don't don't think that I'm just pushing Drum Workshop. I think Drum Workshop does make some excellent drums as well as a lot of other manufacturers such as, well, Yamaha, Sakai, um, things like that. And if you guys aren't familiar with Sakai, Sakai used to be the drum builder for Yamaha. And they built, bar none, the best drums ever in the world. They're philosophy on building drums was amazing. They strived to be the best, and if you had it, you were guaranteed you had a good one. Yamaha and Sakai split up. Sakai went their separate ways and made some awesome drums again, and Yamaha kind of took a step back, but that's not saying Yamaha's bad. They still have pride. It's just that when their master drum workers went in a different direction, they kind of step back a little bit. And for those drum historians, you already know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't 
heard the story on Sakai and Yamaha, you can do a little research and read on it. It's it's a, it's a it's pretty interesting. But I digress. Let's talk about bearing edges. 99% of the drums that you buy, even drum workshop, even though they strive to be the best, things can change according to environment, shipping, temperature changes, what have you. Just like guitars, necks shift, drums can shift also. So keep that in mind, especially when we're working with very thin plies. So while it may leave the factory an outstandingly level, smooth bearing edge, it may reach your home and not be so smooth. And we can't really blame the manufacturer for this, although there is plenty of manufacturers who make some horrific bearing edges. And that goes into how much time gets put into the bearing edges. And why am I wasting so much time on bearing edges? Well, because like I said, it's 90% of how your drum is going to sound. There's nothing worse than a sound guy that's trying to mic a kit to make it blend nicely and sound uniform with every hit. Or a good sound guy. And he's going, what the hell's wrong with this guy's drum kit? So. How do we do this? Well, the first thing we want to do is make sure everything's tensioned. How how are we going to diagnose? I'm going to help you diagnose your bearing edges. Or drum hoop. I have a bent hoop. But we're going to help diagnose where the problem lies. Give you a direction to go in, if you will. So what you got, we're all used to tune in by tapping with our finger, and that works. But what happens when we can't get that one lug to tap at the same time? Resonance is the other ones. Okay. Well, sometimes we're just not getting it right, or we're not, we don't have the hoop perfectly centered with the correct gap around it. It could be drawing more to one side than the other, and all takes its toll and it adds up. But if you have a drum dial, if you don't have a drum dial, I suggest you get a drum dial because that's my number one tool in diagnosing and it's not like I said not a push for drum dial it's just that they work and I use a digital dial you don't have to but I I'm I don't have it next to me but I use a, a digital dial and usually when I come to that one log if I come to a one log sometimes it's two sometimes it's three that just can't get to maintain that proper tension and sometimes you don't notice it until you go to a higher tension For instance, snare drums. You might not notice it on a tom. But once you start putting higher tensions on your drum head, you start noticing that difference because the tension is now drawing down on that bearing edge more. It's pulling down on it. And now we're going to start to vary if we have any variations in, in in the bearing edge itself. So drum dial is a good way to start that. And when you're using your drum dial, if you're using it on a tom, or floor tom, or anything you're using it on, over-tension it more than you normally would to get a reading. Now, tuning them using a drum dial when you're done is a whole different story. You can tune them normal. But to find out if your bearing edges are proper, you're going to over-tension them a little bit. I hope that makes sense to you, because you're drawing down. You're really going to bring out the flaw if you do that. You want perfect bearing edges. So we tension them down, and then... Nine times out of ten on that lug you can't tune, somewhere in between lug A and C, okay, you got A, B, C, somewhere between A and C, it doesn't have to be on a lug, it can be in between those points, you're going to have a blemish or a rise or dip in your bearing edge or just a bearing edge that's cut willy-nilly. I'm sure you guys have seen that, or a thicker ply, maybe. The ply's a little thicker in that one spot, causing an uneven pull. So these are all things we can diagnose with a simple drum dial. It points us in the direction. Then we pull our drum hoop off, and we pull our, our head off, and we, we look to see. All right, now we got an idea. Where are we looking at? So the first thing we're going to do, and I use granite, but... I know it's not available to a lot of you guys. And if you got a good flat level surface, and when I mean flat and level, it's got to be flat and level. Perfection is green, a big slab of granite. Um, but you can you can find some, what's really nice is, is you know, 
my wife would get mad. You know the big uh, cake turn, turn? I don't know what they call them. They're, they're rotisserie. They turn, and you put cakes on them to decorate cakes. And if you can get one made of marble, this works really good. It's a good. It's not. The, it's not exact, but it's going to give you a good idea. It's close to most people. It's perfectly level, but in the drum world, big slab of granite is what you need. And they're very my my granite's like eight hundred bucks, so it's expensive. Anyhow, the first thing you're going to start is you're going to take your bearing edge and you're going to flip. You're going to flip your drum upside down. You're going to sit it on your flat surface, and you're going to shine light under it to see if you have any light showing through. If you have any light showing through at all, guess what? You've found your problem. You know you got a bearing, your bearing edges are not right. Now, they doesn't mean they it was always this way. It means that this has probably happened over time or climate change or what have you. you. We could have a drum that's totally going out of round even. But the bearing edge, remember I said, is 90, 90% of, of the sound. We can attempt and mostly bring, as long as it's not too far gone, bring that drum back into acceptable acoustic principles or, or properties. So what we do is we find out where that is. First thing we do is we look at our bearing edge and we inspect it. We make sure there's no grooves or anything taken out of it. If you have chunks taken out of your bearing edge, and this can happen, just hitting them okay, with your sticks. Even underneath your hoops, it, over time, it can loosen wood and particles can fall out. We notice this a lot on a lot of older Ludwig kits. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fill those gaps. Start right off the bat. Yeah, we're diving in a little deeper. We've got to fill those gaps. Um, a little wood filler. Just let them sit. Sand them up. Okay? If you're going to do that and you're going to go that far, the best bet, and if you're good, if you are happen to be good with tools and woodworking, one of the easiest things you can do is if you have a table router is we can cut new bearing edges. And that's what I do almost every time, even on new drums. I will recut a bearing edge. Why? Because I know my cut is going to be superior because I'm doing it myself and I have a knack for it. I've done it so much. So I'll recut either a 45 or a rollover and then I'll figure out my back cut. Or I might listen to the Tom when I get it and say, you know what? I need a little deeper. I'm going to change this 45 to a rollover cut and uh, change the whole tonal vibrational frequency of this Tom. So I do that a lot. So well, we want that bearing edge perfect. So the first thing is we clean up our bearing. No matter what direction you're going, figure out where your flaw is. Clean up your bearing edge. If you want to, cut, if you, if you want to attempt to cut bearing edges, if you've got old drums to exper experiment on, that's fantastic. Because nothing's worse than a bad bearing edge, I assure you. So we do this, and if you don't want to go that far, if you say you just have a little fraction that's you got a little light coming through, what you do is you get some sandpaper, and you I like to use about a to start about three hundred, and what I do is I sit my tom on it and I give it a little twist of sandpaper that goes over my whole a big sanding piece of another piece of granite. And I give it a little twist, and I set it back on my other granite. I shine the light until that light is gone. Now you have a bearing edge that's tonally going to reproduce sound better than it did before because it's properly cut. Now, I don't mean to make such a big deal about bearing edges, but it is the most important thing. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have seen videos where you have guys and they take these cheap kids' children's drum kits and they tune them up and they put decent heads on them and they get some okay sounds. But if they recut those bearing edges, guess what happens to those cheap children's drum sets? They sound just as good as high-end drums. Now they're not the quality, they don't have the hardware, they don't have the build quality. You just made them sound equally on par. And I know a lot of you are thinking, yeah, but that's not maple. That's not walnut. That's not this and that's not that. Well, there's another misconception in drums. Your birch and your, your lighter resonant woods are tonally and sonically amazing. 
That's why they've used them for so long. That's why they've been used for centuries. Because they're a real resonant wood. That's why they use them in guitars, acoustic guitars, any acoustic violins, what have you. They're a nice vibrating wood. So that's very, very important. Of course, drum head is a preference, but generally we want the drum to ring at what sounds nice. Tuning we can get into in a different episode, tuning your resonant head to match the the vibrational tone of the tom. And for those of you who don't know, I will touch on it real quick. Your toms. Each individual tom, you can have two of the same toms. They're going to have a different vibrational frequency. Made the exact same way, everything. That's because the woods are different. The greens are different. Each piece is tonally unique. And what I do is each, I I actually tap my toms. If you want to get on the drums that I build. Now, I don't, of course, I. you can do this. You can tune any drum like this. But I want mine for the customer to be perfect. So I find out the vibrational tone, what pitch, what um, what note the tom is vibrating at. And you can do this with a microphone and a cell phone if you want to, or you can get a tool to do it. And um, you tap it, and it's going to give you, and you can't change it. I mean, you can, once you change your bearing edges, like I just said, you'll change it a bit. But you're going to find out what that tom rings at. What's it resonate at? And then you tune your toms to match that resonance. Your resonance. You're, cha- you're tuning your heads to match the resonance of the tom. That's tonally as perfect as you can get. In other words, that drum is singing in harmony the best it can be. And once we get outside of those perimeters, so you're tuning your bottom heads, you're tuning your top heads, and people, you can tune them and eat. People have different ideas or things that sound, because sound is subjective. But as far as harmonizing the top head with the bottom head along in conjunction with the tom itself, that is tonal frequency that you're merging together to create harmony. I hope that makes sense. Now, that's not the same across the board because with our snare drums, we have a whole different concept going on because we're using wires on the bottom and we're looking for a different sound, okay? So we have our three tunings, of course, our high, medium, and low, and everywhere is in between. So snare drums, snare drums themselves, are a different animal. However, what I have found is if we take those same principles that I just told you and we apply them to a snare before we put on our snare wires, and this this is, I'm basing this on a five and a half inch depth snare, by the way, and a 14 inch size. What I find is if you tune those frequencies again as close as you can together using the resonance of the shell, okay, that that snare still sings with the wires on and sounds amazing. So keep that in mind. Now, as far as woods go, listen, your maples, things like that, they're warm. But you can change their warmth by having a bad bearing edge or a bearing edge that really, if it to me, With running a walnut or a maple, I do a rollover on them because they're a warm wood and a rollover bearing edge gives you a nice warm tone that matches. My personal preference, all of you might not not agree. Cutting your own bearing edges is not a big deal as long as you're good and you know what depth you can. I mean, you can really, really get some major attack with your toms. With a sharp 45 edge. I've cut bearing edges like teepees. And you want to talk attack? Ooh. Problem is, the sharper you cut them, the less time they last. Um, the more work, work you need to do on them later on. And I don't, 
as far as longevity goes, that's not a good way to go. But as far as attack goes, it works really, really well. Um, I get a lot of guys that come to me with older kits and they say, I want more attack out of my kit. And they I give them a nice sharp cut, um, almost an equal angle, um, negative and positive. They get all the attack in the world. And I would do this on a drum kit that's on its way out anyhow. I wouldn't do it on something that you care about. I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you. Um, but not that you can't cut that down again. I mean, you can cut it down again and we can redo it. You mean you could, I could keep going till you had <laughs> electric size <laughs> rolling tabs if you want. I mean, we, we can keep going, but you're going to, the sound is going to change each time and you're starting um, from page one every time. So I hope that makes sense to you guys. So speaking of drum sets, they've got a lot going on here in the studio. And when I mean a lot, I got my kit torn apart over here, the one we've been doing the uh, hybrid conversion with. And if you're not familiar, we're running a 20-inch Mapex Tom. And then I have some Yamaha, sta uh, Yamaha Stage Custom 10 by 7 I think it is. And then we're running a 14-inch Floor Tom. And these are Stage Customs that I'm using with this Mapex bass drum. Why did I go this route? Well, price was a factor, but Yamaha makes some really nice resonant shells, and their bearing edges are pretty good right out of the box, and they have a beautiful finish and good hardware, and it's cost-effective. And yes, I've already cut my bearing edges on this. I should have did a video to show you guys, but you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So anyhow, I have the... Uh, head off the, off this already, but I have another kit that's coming. I just ordered another kit. Why? Well, I was shopping for a snare drum, and it. Everybody says, Mike, why aren't you building them? Unfortunately, in the United States right now, it costs me more money to build quality drums than it does to buy them from another country. And that's just the state that we are in because America, America has convinced itself that it's the best at everything. And um, we've, we're ruining ourselves because of it. Um, we've lost our principles and we've lost our way and it's starting to affect people who have trades and what they do. So in other words, I can't get my materials at what another manufacturer overseas it can get the same materials in better and sell them for done. And that's a sad. Not that I won't build you a kit. You want a kit? I'll build you a custom kit just like I used to build. The problem is it costs so much and I can't. I have a conscience. So it's hard for me to charge somebody when I can send them a different direction and get them very close to the same results. And that's what's happening with drum kits across the board. They're big money. And there's manufacturers, and remember I just talked good about Drum Workshop. Um, even though they're great, from the beginning they've always overcharged. So is Ludwig. So is all the manufacturers. Used to be a point where I could surpass anything that they built and well beyond at at a uh, at just a tick over half of what they charged and um, now and now the prices are even higher because of the what I just said especially anything that's built here in the United States but your big your big names are starting to do the same thing even though when they're not built in the United States so even though the prices in other countries are still cheap. Don't let them shit you. <laughs> and it's hard to, it's hard for me to build these kits at a reasonable rate and, and, and pass that on to you. Um, my kits will always be first rate and it's not the work that I'm charging for. Because I enjoy doing that. It's, I have to charge you know, materials, and materials are unfortunately now through the roof. Enter other kits. So, I just 
I haven't ordered it yet. I'm going to order it either tonight or tomorrow. But I am going to do it. Um, I'm going with a Ludwig. Hear me out. A break, a, a break beats. And I'm doing the, um, the Sahara swirl. And it looks like an old, um, kind of like a oyster finish, but it's not. There's something different going on. I haven't seen one in real life. There's something, zoom in, it's a little different. I don't think it's glossy. I'm not sure, but it's got that oyster pearl look to it from the pictures. And it's only a 16 inch kick and it's a 10 inch tom and uh, I believe a 13 inch floor tom. I guess it's 16 inch kick, 16 by, I think it's 14 by 16, 14 deep. And I'm going to do a hybrid conversion on this one also. And I'm probably going to be selling off what I'm doing over here in the studio or just sitting it to the side because I'm running out of room in here. And um, so I got that going on and I, I just bought some more triggers for the drums because I keep adding more and more and doing more hybrid stuff. And these rolling triggers are really, really, really good for you acoustic drummers out there as I am. Um, and I just came off the roll in VAD 306, the complete electronic kit. And I am more pleased with these triggers than I am with the Roland kit. And there's a few reasons why. Number one reasons why they, these react really nice. I can play them where I want. And I'm using my acoustic toms, throwing on mesh heads, getting my full kit feeling, feel all the way around. And having it my way without using Roland's really, they're garbage shells. And I mean, when I say garbage shells, and I'm not saying it, like, I'm not trying to put down anybody who has a Roland or anything like that. I'm telling you as a drum builder that their shells are on par with like a Griffin snare. Anybody who've ever experimented and bought one to see, you know, their incredible $40 price. And you get one and you go, what the, I mean... We all know that the hardware's junk on it and you can't get them to sound good. And then you only you really see the quality and of, of the plies and the bearing edges. And they're that. They're that. They might even be a little bit worse. But they don't rely on it because, well, they're electronic drums. They rely on a trigger. They're not singing. And one thing electronic players tend not to do is to make sure that everything's tensioned and properly and working properly. I'm a believer that everything still should be tensioned properly and equal as to put less stress on the shells that are, well, inferior. We really got to take care of them if they're not built well. That makes sense, right? So anyhow, we got some more triggers coming. We have this Ludwig kit it's going to be coming and we have some other things going on too. Hold on one second. This just came. I am new to these mesh heads because I'm an acoustic drummer guys. So I'm used to playing on the Roland V series heads and I hear a lot about these Remos and this is the silent stroke. This happens to be a 10 inch that's going to go on a 10 inch time, a 10 inch Tom and I'm taking off. I hit right now on the 10 inch Tom, or I did have the uh, Roland V series mesh head on it. But I have a Roland, one Roland Tom left. So I'm putting the mesh head back on that, the Roland head back on the Roland Tom. I'll be selling that on Reverb at an incredibly low price, probably. And I'm going to be using this on my Tom. Maybe if I can open it. So I'm curious to the how different they are. Well, here they are. As you can see, you can see through it. Um, definitely not as thick as the uh, Roland head, but I'm sure it's going to work out. Nice, and I like that. I'm a Remo guy, anyhow. I always like Remo drum heads, I like Aquarians too. It just depends on what, once again, what drums I'm using them on. I find that certain heads, no, not electric, but certain heads on acoustic drums function better on certain woods. 
That's a whole nother episode also. So, that came in, so that's good. We can scratch that off. We had now worked to all your guitar players. I told you we'd, we'd uh, segue into something else. Well, I got the uh, Les Paul build kit. It's going to be here tomorrow, I think. Maybe the next day, but I think tomorrow. And I paid under 100 bucks for it. That, that, um, that we're going to build up. And that was bought on a whim, too, because Gibson and Epiphone pissed me off. So we're going to build this to see if I can outbuild Epiphone. As a drum builder, let's see if a drum builder can build a guitar and outbuild Epiphone. Now, this build kit, I can't say the pickups are going to be good. I can't say anything like that. Um, wood quality should be decent. Even if it's flawed, I can fix it. So that's one thing I can do. Because I can work with the wood. And it's got a flamed maple top, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it's maple back, I believe. I remember correctly, but it was cheap and it's a Les Paul and uh, I got rid of my flying school bus V that sold on reverb. I got my money back out of it, made a little bit and made somebody happy. So if you haven't caught my videos on the flying V, how disappointed I was in that go back and check that out. Um, Epiphone Gibson left a real bad taste in my mouth on that one. And then I got rid of the flying V and when I ordered the Flying V, I didn't like the pick guard. I like flashy. So, and it was a 58 Corona Epiphone V, limited edition. That is a lie. It's not so limited. Epiphone and Gibson lie. There's nothing limited about it. So, I bought it based on certain things. Color, description, build. And none of it was <laughs> true. <laughs> so it's like it's like ordering a car and uh, jet black, and you you order yourself up a, a jet black, don't get a, old school jet black WS6 Ram Air Trans Am Blackbird. And you're waiting for your car. This is based on a real story. And you're waiting for your car. You're waiting for your car to come in, and they send you a bright blue Z28 instead. But what? That's not what I ordered. Well, you know, you know, colors vary. Build, builds vary. That's basically what they pulled on me. It was, it was horrible. Anyhow, I ordered a pick guard for it because I wanted a black pearl oyster pick guard for my, what was supposed to be a antique, natural, beautiful, 58 grown of flying V. And uh, so I ordered this thing up even before the guitar got here. And this just came in today because they're so hard to get and expensive. So, anyhow, here it is. And now it's sitting here and it's got nothing to go on. I paid 100 bucks for this thing and it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, you pulled it out of the bag bit, but I can tell that it's gorgeous. It is quality. So this is going to be going on reverb to get my hundred bucks. It'll be 110 with shipping and, um, very high quality piece right here. And, uh, unless I get another flying V, which I don't anticipate this is going back on the reverb. What else do I got on reverb right now? I got these. I got these on. These are the Roland Tom mounts. Very heavy duty, very stout, beautiful chrome. One thing I cannot complain about with these Roland kits, these V kits, is their hardware is nice, and this is no exception. Um, fantastic hardware. I'm just doing a one-up, two-down setup, so I don't need these. I actually run one of these with my uh, with my Yamaha Stage Custom Tom, but I got two of these left over. They're brand new. They're on Revar reverb right now i think they're less than a hundred bucks guys for the pair it's a steal you can't even find these things um if you want to keep your set aesthetically correct they, they simply go over your your um your symbol hardware your symbol stands and then your toms or whatever can mount on here there is a ball it does rotate any direction you want as a matter of fact these six three up and down that's how the to toms went on on my yamaha i got it down yes you can I'll them out to the side. 
kind of like kind of like this and you can mount them sideways and that's how my tom is mounted over here even upside down so this ball goes any way you want it to nice positive lock very sturdy and stout you won't break them the chrome plating is excellent if you guys want to check out my uh my shop on reverb that is a um wicked nation drums and a baker percussion and at the end is fulton street beats so there's that what else do we got going on well i think that's about it to tell you the truth but um i think that's quite a bit i think we covered quite a bit just want to get the bearing edge thing down to you guys i, I want to i wanted to let you know how important your bearing edges is, are for you drummers out there and you're not happy with the sound of your kit maybe you're thinking about getting a new kit because my drum set just sounds like shit and i've tried new heads i've tried everything mike it just doesn't work check your bearing edges check the level of your bearing edges make sure they're right make sure they're not nicked make sure they're level even if you have a high-end kit and you're just scratching your head make sure because something may have shifted and changed due to atmospheric conditions that's beyond our control it happens all the time you guitar players know this when you get a guitar, you have to acclimate it to where it's going to be because your neck is going to change. Woods expand, contract according to moisture level, temperature, everything. Drums do the exact same thing, but even more because they're thinner. Nobody ever talks about that. So, there we go. Listen, guys, I want to thank you for joining me on Drum Talk, Fulton Street Beats. I hope you'll hit that like button, share, subscribe if you have anything you're interested in. Drop it in the comment section below. You want ideas? Do you want to drop in any ideas for some new uh, content or something you just want to talk about? Let me know, guys. It's good to hear from you. It's good to see you. And remember, it's rock and roll that makes the world go round.